opinion. I can hear you're getting emotional. That was a remark thrown into a discussion I was having with a man who really should have known better. <laughs> uh, and it wasn't said to me many years ago when I was young and inexperienced. It was said to me just a few years ago. It was a great way to try and derail the debate. Uh, he was losing. Uh, he still <laughs> lost. But it, it certainly set me back. And afterwards, I thought, what I should really have said to him was, and Professor Blount, I can hear you're getting angry. And maybe that would have the same effect on him. It occurred to me that next time I will be better prepared, that I will know what to do when someone tries to play a tactic on me. I think one should think of situations like that as a learning experience. So my message for you today is nothing is wasted. Good or bad, you can get something out of it. Now, as you've heard, I am a Cambridge professor, I'm an FRS, I'm a master of Churchill College, but I wouldn't like you to think I'd always know what I wanted to do, that my life was carefully planned. I think when you're young, it's very easy to think that you uniquely are in a fog about what you're trying to do, and everyone else knows exactly what they want to do and how to get there. And I would say, rubbish. I don't think many people live their lives like that, and I certainly haven't. But what I do think is, as I've gone through life, I have taken the different experiences I've had and woven them into the fabric of what comes next. A bad experience may teach you never to go near that situation again, or, as with my first example, teach you how to do better. I think that Everything that happens, like your mic packs up, you have to learn how to get through it in one piece without falling flat on your face, and it's not always easy. But bad experiences may teach you, you never want to do another TEDx talk. I will back that <laughs> <laughs> Now, let me take you back. Let me take you back to when I was young and inexperienced. And I had finished my PhD, and my husband and I decided we were going to go to the States. It looked like there was something there for both of us that would satisfy both of us. Um, but my first postdoc was a total disaster. I spent two years being utterly miserable. I produced just about no results. Um, I really got culture shock, actually. Uh, and I found the whole experience very dismaying. So what did I learn from that? Well. With hindsight, not at the time, I realised that being a failure at something doesn't mean that you are inherently a failure, that you're always going to be a failure. And I hope that it has also helped me understand better, now that I've supervised students and postdocs myself, I hope it has helped me understand when they are struggling. And I can say to them, look, I know what it's like, I've been there, and they can absolutely see that I know what I'm talking about because I have this sort of two-year blank in my CV. Now, obviously, I wouldn't be standing here if my next postdoc had been equally disastrous. I was very lucky. I, I stayed at Cornell uh, for reasons to do with my domestic circumstances and the need to get another visa. I stayed at Cornell. I swapped who I worked with. I, I moved field slightly. I worked with a different professor. And this professor was just a totally different kind of person to work for. And he encouraged me. And he was the first person who, who really encouraged me to think about an academic career. I had to be able to pick myself off this very literal floor that I had fallen on failing to do my research at all well. Um, I had to motivate myself to get on, but I quickly found that I'd fallen in love with the research in a way I never had done before. So I think resilience is another skill you have to learn. But having been through that process, as I say, I hope it helps me sympathise with my students, some of whom undoubtedly find research very disturbing and difficult to get on with. Throughout my career, I've moved from one research topic to another. I've worked on starch, I've worked on pl plants, I've worked with plastics, I've worked with living cells. And I think one can always take what you learn sort of in the previous 
bit of your research and turn it into something that is relevant to what you're doing now. So, for instance, at one point I was working on the mechanical properties of snack foods made out of starch. Think cheesy watsits. Think what happens when you bite a cheesy watsit. You want the right mechanical properties. <laughs> so, the theoretical equations that were relevant to, to getting some sense out of our experimental results turned out some years later those equations were just as relevant when I was trying to understand what happens when you slice carrots. Carrots are a vegetable foam, the same equations apply. Now, you might be thinking, those are really odd things for a physicist to study. And many of my coll colleagues thought the same thing. When I set out and started working on the really quite messy world of food and biological systems, some of my colleagues were undoubtedly quite sniffy. Um, did not think that these really very complex materials were at all appropriate for a physicist. And again, relatively early in my career, I had the kind of remark that is very hard to deal with thrown at me by the then senior professor in my department, the Cavendish Lab in Cambridge, who said, things have come to a sad pass when people at the Cavendish study starch. And again, I didn't really have a very good answer. I could try and say, but it's really interesting. Or I could try and say with a bit more sort of uh, sang froid, uh, well, physics is what physicists do. But neither of them are particularly good reposts, and I'm not sure I've ever got a very good one to that one. But nevertheless, I hope I had the last laugh, because as uh, complexity has become sort of fashionable, um, far more people are moving into the kind of areas I was working in 20 years ago. So I think, yep, yeah, well, tough. I did, I, I did the right thing in staying with her. Now, as my first anecdote showed, I don't think it's just a case of knowing facts and taking a fact from here and applying it there or a theoretical equation. I think it's also about the soft skills of how to deal with situations. I expect many of you will have had that experience when a child of being taken to visit an elderly relative and your parents sort of trying to tell you how to behave and you feel as if there are all these adult rules and you don't really understand them but somehow you've got to get through the maze of this visit. And I think that kind of feeling that there are rules that you have to apply is something that applies to professional life too. The difference perhaps is when you're an adult you know when you can break rules and you know when you're likely to get away with it. But I think you can learn an awful lot in this sort of soft skill arena by watching other people, watching other people get things right or get things wrong. And you can learn from both of them. So think about all the awful presentations you've ever been to. And I, I know I'm sort of putting myself at risk here, but just pause for a minute and think about the awful presentations you've been to, where people have had umpteen PowerPoint slides written in very small font and you can't possibly take in what is said or remember it because it's just been thrown at you really, really fast. Or the one where the speaker spends the entire time muttering into their shoes or standing pointing at the screen and never showing you eye contact at all. Now, you can sit and go to sleep during presentations like that. And if you're the parent of a small child, that may be the best thing to do during the afternoon. But otherwise, I would say you should watch and think, well, I wouldn't do it like that. And I realise that 10-point font really doesn't work in this lecture theatre. Um, so you can learn and you can profit from it. And one of the situations where I think I've learned most is actually sitting on committees and watching the chair, who has quite clearly never been videoed. So they absolutely don't know what they're doing wrong. So you will all have seen a committee chair who never stops talking, never gives anyone else a chance to talk. Or the committee chair who never intervenes at all and just lets two of the committee have an argument over in one corner and everyone else gets very bored. And he's just doodling on the agenda, or she. Or you have the situation where no comfort break disaster. Or <laughs> no coffee and biscuits, that's bad too. Or the meeting just overruns horribly. You've seen all these examples of bad chairing and they're all quite straightforward to sort out, get someone to organise some coffee. It's not that difficult. So do you actually profit from watching people get things wrong? Because I think it's a very valuable skin to, to um, 
get under your belt, as it were, so that when you're asked to take on some new and exciting opportunity, you are in a good position to do it well. Now, I think this willingness to dip your toe into lots of different ponds is very important. When I was introduced, it was said that I chaired the Royal Society Education Committee. And I was asked to do this. It's school education, it's not higher education. And I was asked to do it, and I said, but I don't know anything about schools. And they said, no, no, we don't want anyone who actually knows what they're talking about. We just want someone who's going to draw all the different bits together. So I thought, OK, I'll have a go. And um, it was really educational, if you like, taking on that role. I got to attend a select committee, for instance. I had a meeting with the schools minister, Nick Gibb, who, um, during the course of the meeting, asked me to do a long division sum. And I said, um, excuse me, Minister, I don't really think that's the best use of our time. And the, the staff around the edge of the room sort of had a quiet snigger, I think, because I refused to do this long division sum. And it was during the time that Michael Gove was the Secretary of State for Education. And there were consultations coming out all the time. Um, and I had to read, read the you know, suggestions about the curriculum and everything and help the wonderful staff here do the... Um, responses and everything. I learned a huge amount. Now, had I known back in 2010 when I did this that I was going to be the master of a Cambridge college, I couldn't have asked for better preparation. Most researchers don't know about school education. And for me to have had this crash course was really, really useful. But in 2010, I had no aspiration to be master of Churchill. So it was just by the by. But I think it demonstrates the fact that Whatever you do, you will probably find it comes in useful sometime or other, as long as you have the confidence to join up those dots, which may not be entirely obvious. And as I say, that applies to bad experiences too. So if I go back to the um, remark I introduced this talk with, Athene, I can hear you're getting emotional. That was said to me when I was Cambridge University's gender equality champion by a senior colleague who did not like the fact he was losing the argument. But it, it sort of sums up why I had become the gender equality champion, because I was fed up with sitting on committees where I was stuck there as the token female professor and then find that no one was listening to me, or I would look around me and think, why are all these other professors getting more space or students or whatever resource? And somehow my voice falls on stony ground. And it, I think it was because I was different. So the comment that was explicitly said to me when I tried to be head of department that I was too emotional is the same thing again. I was a female in the male world. If you don't know physics, it's very male. I do not look like your typical physicist. And I think I just sort of threw them. And this comment about being emotional, I've come to realise it simply means you're not like us. It doesn't mean, actually, we think you're about to burst into tears. But they might be worried I might be going to burst into tears, but I have never done that, so they have no justification. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that it's one area where, being a woman, you are judged differently. It seems to be all right to be cross, angry, thump the table. I have seen men do that. Don't think I've seen women do that, but I'm not saying they can't. And you have this situation where being sort of different is an issue. And that is why I became the university's gender equality champion. Again, I learned a huge amount from that role, including, I hope, how to be more persuasive. So you can learn from all experiences. I took what was anger, but a slow burn kind of anger, not a thump the table kind of anger, to take to that work, being gender equality champion. And I hope I made a difference in my own university while I was doing that. But I think you can learn from any experience, good or bad, and you should take away from this that nothing is wasted so as you leave here, I hope you'll go away, think about how to be true to yourself, how to take advantage of the different experiences that come your way, and not forget that luck is something to play with, so good luck with it all. Thank you. <laughs>